A few years ago, the Gospel of Judas, a long lost gospel, was discovered by the National Geographic Society. This story was covered by every major news source and some dubbed it the discovery of the century. The Friday before Easter, the Society aired a television special detailing this extraordinary discovery and examining its implications. Many questions were raised by this finding, but two in particular are crucial to the Christian faith. Why was the Gospel of Judas, for example, omitted from the Bible? And might other writings be considered for inclusion? Although a wonderful find, the Gospel of Judas was not a huge shock. In his work, Against All Heresies, the renowned Church Father Irenaeus from the second century refers to this purported gospel. Every book of the New Testament was written in Greek, but the Gospel of Judas was instead written in Coptic, an Egyptian language. Additionally, it was written after the New Testament. Its inclusion in a group of documents from a different religion called Gnosticism was more significant. The Gnostics despised physical existence and preached the existence of two gods, the Creator, God revealed in Genesis 1, and a secret, hidden, and unidentified God who dwells in the Kingdom of Light. Gnosticism asserts that it reveals this unidentified God. The core of the Gospel of Judas is the revelation of an unidentified God. Irenaeus openly acknowledged that the Gnostics produced numerous diverse Gospels and works, but he and all other church authorities of the 2nd through 4th centuries held that their teachings were gravely flawed and destructive. He said, they adduce an unspeakable number of apocryphal and spurious writings which they have forged to bewilder the minds of foolish men and of such as are ignorant of the scriptures of truth. So, many spiritual texts that are now occasionally referred to as the lost books of the Bible were authored by this religion, which is fundamentally different from Christianity. It may seem evident that the Gospel of Judas should not be included in the Bible, but what about the other books? People who question which books should be in the Bible have appeared at various stages in the church's history, either wishing to add or remove some. The key takeaway from this is that the churches already knew the contents of the books of the Bible since they were already using them in their preaching and worship. Simply put, these books had not received official recognition. A man by the name of Marcion presented one of the earliest objections to the widely accepted canon of writings that the churches were accepting as scripture. He was a wealthy and well-known church leader who resided in a seaside city in northern Asia Minor, today's Turkey, at the beginning of the second century AD. He had a very distorted understanding of what the teachings of the Apostle Paul taught, despite his zeal for them. In the end, he argued that only the Gospel of Luke and the ten letters of the Apostle Paul should be regarded as scripture, with all other writings, including the Old Testament, being disregarded. The churches in the Mediterranean region had to react as a result of his wealth and power. This challenge served as a powerful impetus for the churches to proclaim the writings they had already been citing as scripture in a formal and public manner. Therefore, the church started creating the idea of the canon of scripture as early as the 2nd century AD to differentiate those texts that were believed to be inspired by God and therefore bore divine authority. The word standard is derived from Greek, where it originally denoted a rule. It was then used to refer to the standard books that comprised the Bible. Marcion's problem, according to famous Princeton historian Bruce Metzger, was accelerating the process of fixing the church's canon, a process that had already begun in the first half of the second century. By the time of Jesus, Judaism universally acknowledged the 39 volumes that made up the Hebrew Bible, also known as the Old Testament. Because of this, Jesus was able to quote from a variety of Old Testament writings by simply referring to them as a cohesive and unified whole known as the Scriptures. The 27 books that make up the New Testament were formally accepted as part of the Bible's canon between the 2nd and 4th century. The letters of Paul were referred to as Scripture by the Apostle Peter himself, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. The Gospel of Mark is referred to as Scripture in one of the earliest church writings composed after the last book of the New Testament was finished. Early church leaders frequently cited passages from the various New Testament books, giving them legitimacy as divine revelation in a manner that stands out from other writings. However, it is crucial to understand that the four Gospels were duplicated and distributed as soon as they were written throughout the regions of the world where churches had been established including Israel, Syria, Asia Minor, Egypt, Greece, Italy, and other countries. The churches started using them frequently for instruction, 
worship, and devotion. The collection of Paul's, Peter's, James, Jude's, and John's letters, as well as the letter to the Hebrews and the book of Revelation, can all be said to fall under this category. They were quickly copied, given to the churches, and used frequently as documents that were created by God and necessary for the upbringing and development of believers. Believers read and applied these texts as a revealed Word of God wherever churches had been established. This indicates that no one person made a private decision about what should be included in the Bible. Alternatively, no group of people decided to do this and then imposed their will on all the other churches. In actuality, the procedure went exactly the other way. By the time the conferences of church leaders who created lists of New Testament books affirmed the inspired and infallible nature of the Bible formally, churches all over the world had long recognized and used them. The church did not create the canon, but came to recognize, accept, and confirm the self-authenticating quality of certain documents, writes Metzger. No book was accepted as scripture in the 3rd and 4th centuries until it had been extensively used by the churches from the start. This last criteria of course, eliminates the notion that any document may or should be added to the Bible at this time. Therefore, it fails on every count when it comes to deciding whether a recently found manuscript like the Gospel of Judas should be incorporated into the Bible. Even though it purports to be from Judas, one of the twelve, there is historical evidence to suggest that it is not authentic, not the least of which is the fact that Judas hanged himself immediately after betraying Jesus, who was later executed. Matthew chapter 27 verse 5. Furthermore, this book's teaching is Gnostic and at odds with the majority of fundamental Christian beliefs. Finally, the church never used it and actively forbade its application. There aren't any further books that belong in the Bible, even if an actual letter written by the Apostle Paul or Peter or any other apostle were to be found. As amazing as such a discovery could be, we would not think about including it in the Bible. A large percentage of Bible scholars dismiss these so-called lost books of the Bible that were allegedly misplaced and for very excellent reasons. The Gospel of Judas, for instance, contains examples of flagrant falsehoods including Jesus allegedly marrying Mary Magdalene and even claiming that he had children with her. It also claims that Judas supposedly betrayed Christ because he was instructed to do so by the Lord. Of course, there is no biblical or historical proof to support either of these claims. So, it was a simple choice to reject the Gospel of Judas today because it totally contradicts the four Gospels we have. Other fictitious Gospels or lost books of the Bible include the Secrets of Enoch, Conflict of Adam and Eve with Satan, the Fourth Psalm of Solomon, the Gospel of Philip, the Apocalypse of Peter, and the Gospel of Mary. You don't have to be an expert on the Bible to realize that these books are incompatible with the 66 books of the Bible. They blatantly depart from scripture in both context and doctrine. The wisdom of Solomon, 1 Maccabees, and many other works of this type are included in the so-called Apocrypha, which the Jews outright rejected. None of these texts have ever been acknowledged as having been inspired by God. They contain some fascinating historical information, but they also contain glaring inaccuracies and neither Jesus nor the apostles cited them. The Jews likewise rejected these books of scripture and continue to do so today. Perhaps for this reason, the apostle Paul said, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Galatians chapter one verse eight. The gospel presented in these texts is not the gospel of God. Due to the numerous predictions that were made hundreds and even thousands of years before the events they predicted, we may be certain that the 66 books that make up the Bible are the inspired word of God. The Old Testament was long regarded as the actual word of God and was universally acknowledged to have been inspired by God. By the year AD 180, the early church was clear on what was constituted scripture and what was not. Even though some churches were hesitant over the books of James, Jude, 2nd and 3rd John, 2nd Peter, Hebrews, and Revelation, all other books of the Bible were widely acknowledged by the church, and it didn't take long before all 27 of the New Testament's books were acknowledged as the inspired Word of God. It's important to point out that the Apocrypha and non-canonical texts were never used by early church leaders in their writings or sermons and they were never given the same respect and authority as the New Testament books. They were, and still are, simply not regarded as part of the Bible. We can therefore say with confidence that the 66-book Bible is the living, 
breathing, and authoritative Word of God and is written exactly as God intended. It has been demonstrated to be the live, active Word of God, which can even pierce our thoughts, plans, and motives of the heart, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13, and thus we can put our trust in it. The abundance of fulfilled prophecies, the countless archaeological finds, and the indestructible Word of God more than convince us that the Bible is God communicating to us, that it is His inspired Word, and that it contains all the information we require to be saved. There is a reason the lost books are lost. Let's rely on the ones in the Bible, and if we have to study the extra-biblical ones, let it be simply for fun.